This video is titled Tribute to State Senator Reginald Tate and the untold story of Glenview Communities Black History. To the birth, the life, and the commemoration of the late Senator Reginald Tate. Cheers. 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 Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. 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 Wow, wow. <laughs> I ain't gonna shoot it. <laughs> this is Trisette Tate McNeil, and I am the sister to, sister to the late great. So, Senator. tell me what's going on here today. Tell us real quick. We're doing a Reginald, Senator Reginald Tate's memorial celebration. We've done this for the last two years. This is our third uh -huh. year, and uh, short and sweet. Now, on September the 10th, 2022, friends and family gathered at Glenview Park in Memphis, Tennessee, to celebrate and honor and give a tribute to the late Tennessee State Senator Reginald Tate. Reginald was a friend of mine and I was invited to come to the event. I suggested since I am Memphis' first independent feature filmmaker and I'm also Memphis, Tennessee' first black historical filmmaker in that in 2018 I produced the movie 200 Years of Black Memphis History also in March of 2022 I released a film called Orange Mound a Black Lecture Critical Race Theory so I am Memphis's first black historical filmmaker since that was doing a tribute to my friend Reginald Tate, I decided that I would make a movie about the event. Instead of just celebrating and having a drink and doing a tribute, I decided that I would take an educational approach and create a, create a video to help educate people about Memphis, about black life in Memphis, and at the same time, to still tell the story of our friend, the late state Tennessee State Senator Reginald Tate. So, I want you to go along with me and we're going to tell you the history of Reginald Tate and learn about the history and the culture of Memphis. Let's go to Glenview Park in Memphis, Tennessee and start our story. Here we are again, God. We're so grateful today to be able to be with one another commemorating again our lovely brother, our relative, our friend, our senator, Reginald Tate. We're saying that we love him and we will forever love him, but we give you all the glory, honor, and praise for having experienced what we did throughout his life. And today, we're commemorating also his birthday, where we are celebrating the times, the good times that we had, and the good times that we're looking forward to for those of us who are still here. So as we release this balloon, we're releasing all our pressures, stresses, and everything that he would not like to see us endure. We ask these blessings to continue in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Reggie. Yeah. On the count of three, we release the balloons. One, two, three! Look at there. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah. 
Who are you? I'm Fritrell G. Reddit. So Fritrell, how what's your relationship to Reginald Tate? Uh, Reginald, I go back to 1969. So you got anything juicy to say about Reginald Tate that you can say that there was interest in writing? Uh, he was a different kind of guy. What does that mean? Well, uh, if he saw a pair of shoes he liked, he gonna buy five pairs of the same kind. <laughs> five different colors. Brown, burgundy, black, blue, and gray. <laughs> okay. He always wanted to be sharp. Okay, there you go. So you're Robert Bullock, huh? And you're real best friends of Reginald Taylor. Yeah, we grew up in Glenview. I know his family like he knew mine. We were just like brothers. One, one, one funny thing that happened, kind of not funny, but uh, at his funeral, I was going to get up and say, you know, rap with my best friend. But listening to people talk, he had several best friends <laughs> in this room, which is something I've never really experienced before. Hello, this is Lou and Gary Llewellyn, and we want to share a story with you that Reggie uh, made us famous by giving us a nickname. And we invited him to a Christmas party, and he was elated to be there, and he said, my favorite people, LL and Cool J. <laughs> LL and Cool J. <laughs> Lou Llewellyn and Jerry Llewellyn. Yeah, how were y'all friends? What did y'all do? Oh, man, we did so much stuff. Is the police around? No, no, phone is here. Tell us, we don't, we don't want to, we don't want to tell us no dirt, but tell us something juicy about me. Well, well, he was, um, actually, he was my best man at my wedding, and when I was getting ready to get married, my wife was late coming, and I was gonna leave. Yeah. But he he grabbed me by my tuxedo coat and made me stay. So he's the reason I've been married 43 years, damn ill. I'm Dwight Little. Dwight who? Dwight Little. So Dwight, tell us about yourself and why are you here? I'm here to celebrate the life of uh, Red Tate. Friend of mine. Yeah, okay, okay. And uh you do the comedian. Can you give us a quick a quick hint about yourself? Tell okay, you know well, something funny about Reginald? Oh at the elementary uh, school. Uh-huh. Over, over, yeah. over at the elementary school, yeah. the teacher said, this is amazing. He said, all you little bad-ass kids don't turn in your homework. He said, I tell you what, I'm going to ask some historical questions. If you answer these questions right, I'm going to let you go home early. Right. He said, who said I've been to the mountaintop? A little girl raised her hand. She said, you act like you really know the answer. She said, it was Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, girl, you can go home early. He said, who said, ask not what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country. No little girl with the red hand, the little boy went to raise his hand, waving his hand. And the teacher said, girl, you're doing jumping jacks back there. What you think the answer is? She said, it was President John F. Kennedy. He said, girl, you can go home early. Little boy said, damn, I wish these bitches shut up. The teacher around said, who said that? He said, Tiger Woods and Bill Cosby. You just witnessed a positive story of black friends honoring the legacy of our friend, Reginald Tate. Now, look beside me here. At this corner of South Parkway and Oakland, on the north side of the street, if you travel 200 yards north on Oakland and turn left, the second house on Glenview Street is the start or the beginning of black history and the Glenview community. At the same time, if you travel to the second house on the northeast side, once you cross Oakland on the northeast side of Glenview, you will see the history of white history in the Glenview community. Now, we can venture to say that the Glenview community is the first African American housing or community integration in Memphis. Know that you got this from Anthony Alfie Omar. This is what you must understand about Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee is not only the slave capital of the world, Memphis, Tennessee, and blacks were under siege in Memphis from 1909 when E.H. Crump took office until he died in 1954. 
We talk about the horrors of apartheid in South Africa. We blacks in Memphis had it worse under Memphis racist boss E.H. Crump. In Memphis, a Ku Klux Klan leader operated the Memphis Police Department, and this Klan leader, leader's name graced our federal building in Memphis until two months ago in 2022. You see, his name was Clifford Davis. He was a Ku Klux Klan leader who ran the Memphis Police Department on the E.H. Crump, and our federal building in Memphis was named after this Ku Klux Klan leader. In Memphis, Tennessee, Ku Klux Klan law enforcement kept blacks in a condition worse than apartheid in Memphis. For those of you who do not know the history of Memphis, white racist boss E.H. Crump, E.H. Crump kept blacks under siege for decades. I want you to hear a quote from E.H. Crump that tells his story. He, he writes and said in one of the newspapers, quote, You have a bunch of niggers teaching social equality, stirring up racial hatred. I'm not going to stand for it. I've dealt with niggers all my life, and I know how to treat them. This is Memphis, unquote. You see, in Memphis, Tennessee, most of the police department or Ku Klux Klan members. If a black person got out of order, they would just kill the person and nothing would happen. You see, after E.H. Crump died in 1954, Memphis elected a new mayor named Edmund Orgel in November 1955 who defeated the, who defeated the Crump back uh, Oh, our appointees. You see, now, now that Crump was gone, we move to June, whereas Church of God in Christ led the push for housing integration. You see, back during the Montgomery Borsbach, Borsbach workout, Bob Mason purchased a home on Glenview Street in the segregated community of Glenview. His purchase of a home was part of the civil rights movement in Memphis. Let me be clear. If Charles Harrison Mason Jr. tried to buy a house in Glenview while Crump was alive, he would have been killed or even hung. You see, let me give you some background of Charles Harrison Mason Jr. He was no ordinary black man. He was the son of Bishop Charles Harrison Mason Sr., the founder of the five million member of the Worldwide Church of God in Christ that has over 12,000 churches worldwide. He was known as Bob Mason, and he was the Bishop of the Church in Christ, uh, Mother Church at Lauderdale in Georgia. You see, while he purchased his home in June of 1956, he did not move into the home until 18 months later until February of 1958 when all hell broke loose. You see, when he moved into that house in February of 1958, his church was burned to the ground. And on March 3rd, 1958, they set his Glenview house on fire. While the fire department saved the, his Glenview home, his wife and his family stayed with relatives. The Ku Klux Klan burned a cross in his yard and youth set off a bomb. And he took a note to the FBI that read in cursive, quote, do you remember what happened on Cannon Street several weeks ago? Your brethren in color, it can happen to you. Remember Cannon Street, the man wanted bus integration. Heed this warning. Cannon Street referred to the murder of Lewis Thompson, shot dead in his driveway in January of 1958. 
the case remained unsolved. You see, not only did the FBI not help Barb Mason, a woman showed up at his door and she was said she was a friend and offered to assist. She took some checks and tried to cash them where she was arrested. She told the police that she worked as a prostitute for Bob Mason and he was a, as if he was a pimp. He was arrested, harassed by the FBI and he went under so much pressure that even in 1959 he sold that house at 755 Benview Street. Now, in, and now in 1958, another black man bought a house at 1801 Glenview. And just about seven houses down on the same side, on the south side of Benview. Now, the black man also was no ordinary black man. His name was Reverend Aura W. Norworthy. He was pastor of Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church on Carnes Avenue in the historic community of Orange Mountain. Now, before I tell you more about Reverend Aura W. Northworthy, I want you to see a scene from our 2019 movie titled 200 Years of Black Memphis History and see the spirit of Memphis in 1959. Let's first of all, let's watch a scene from the movie. Interest interesting things did happen in Memphis. A young man who originally went to Morehouse with Dr. Martin Luther King went on to earn a law degree from Harvard University. Um, he invited his friend, Dr. Martin Luther King, to Memphis in 1959. He and other others organized a giant political rally in Memphis at Mason Temple where Dr. King gave his last speech in 1968. But Dr. King came to Memphis in 1959. That, that young man was the late Russell B. Sugarman with fellow attorneys A.W. Willis, Benjamin Hooks, B.N.F. Jones, and H.T. Lockhart, Sugarman was the architect of a legal and political challenge of the white supremacy enforced by law even after Brown ruling was in writing. It was these attorneys who came to change the laws and circumstances in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, Sugarman ran for Public Works Commissioner, Hooks for Juvenile Court Judge, and Steinbeck for City Tax Assessor, and Love and Bonton running for seats on the school board. Not only did Dr. King speak at this gala event, they had gospel singer Mahalia Jackson to sing at the event. In 1964, A.W. Willis became the first African American elected to the Tennessee legislature since Reconstruction. Sugarman followed in 1966, and from that time henceforth, African Americans began to be elected to political offices in Memphis, Tennessee. Just as the church of Bishop Mason burned to the ground in 1958, please refer to an article dated August 7th, 1958. The KKK bombed Reverend Norworth's church right here in Orange Mound. We showed you the video of black people trying to run for office in 1959 and Dr. Martin Luther King coming to Memphis to support blacks running for office. Now, look at this picture of Dr. King coming to Orange Mound at Reverend Northworth's church campaigning for Russell Sugarman and Ben Hooks. While this is speculation, I'm sure that Dr. Martin Luther King visited Reverend Norworth's home in Glenview in 1959.
they were Baptist preachers and friends. Now, in 1959, another black person moved to Glenview, Dr. Joseph Westbrook and Mrs. Westbrook, two prominent educators. He later became assistant superintendent of River City Schools, while Mrs. Westbrook was a project director with Memphis City Schools. Blacks after 1959 began to gradually move into Gunview and the whites move out. Now, let's get to the white history of Gunview. You see, right across the street from both River Norworthy House and where Bob Mason lived is the second house on the northeast side of Glenview and his, is a historic house with the historical marker in the front yard. Look at this historic house and the photo beside me. I have never felt so bad about American history as I feel about this historic house in Glenview. I put carbon in the house next door on the west side I have always passed up and down this earth for decades. The question that you may ask, why does this historic sign upset me and make me feel so bad? You see, in high school literature, I was influenced by transcendental writers in my English class. I was influenced by the writer Alexander Pope and I remember a poem he wrote that said, Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study a man can is man. Unquote. You see, I looked at that historical sign, and the sign brought sadness and tears to my eyes. You see, the marker is about Tennessee Williams, who is noted as one of the greatest playwrights of the 20th century. The marker notes that on July 12, 1935, in the garden behind his house, a group performed Tennessee Williams' first stage play titled Cairo, Shanghai, Bombay. You see, this sign was erected by the Memphis Arts Council and Memphis Business Journal. Clearly, this was a time for white people and white history. If I had a relative at that time, she could have only been a maid or yard worker. It is unfair that white people have a historic sign in a history of 1780 Glenview. They tell the days of the good old glory of the South, and for black people, it was hell on the E.H. Crump in 1935. Unknown and untold is the story of Bob Mason who faced KKK, church, and house fire. He's arrested by the FBI. You see, the Glenview Civic Club had a Glenview plan. It was a business scheme designed to purchase properties put on the market in the neighborhood to sell only to other whites. And they began working to keep people like Mason and keep us black folk out. Now, that sign says Glenview Historic District. Yes, for white people, look at Glenview Park. Look at the railroad. If you cross that track and reach Lamar, you'll come right to McLean. You go up three streets and you'll reach Young Avenue. You turn east and you come to the Cooper Young District, this is where whites live, and you will see clearly economic disparity and economic segregation. While historic Glenview is glorious days of segregation, white supremacy, racism, and black injustice is our Glenview history, and our story of Glenview starts with Bob Mason and Reverend Northworthy, the first blacks who moved on Glenview. I am Anthony M. Elmore telling you another story about black Memphis history.